um, which I'm doing now, great. And um, the recordings will create further experimental research and we respect research protocols. So I'm going to the video that I pre-recorded. I had hoped to be on the top of a mountain doing this live, but um, connection um, meant that that wasn't possible. So instead, um, I've given very quickly put together some footage from um, the session and also some background to the venues that we visited. So I'm going to share my screen. And feel free, to, I'm here, so feel free to interrupt if you want me to pause or anything. Um, I'm very happy to do so. So hopefully you'll see that screen and I'll press play. Actually, I should just do that very quick, quick thing just to say, have you heard audio as I was saying it there? Yes, we can hear the audio. Brilliant. Oh, no, Thank no, you. I didn't actually. Okay, okay, I might stop sharing and just check I've done that right. One second, sorry. Yes, there we go. It's asking me for to share audio, please install Zoom audio device. Ah. No, don't tell me I won't be able to share. And I'm a lecturer in the Department of Design and Studies in the Atlantic Institute of Technology. There, there's some audio, but it's very muted. Okay, so I need to let me. Sorry, guys. Ransom all the rest. Let's see if this is any better. I'm just going to have to up the volume and apologize to my office. In two days' time on April 1st. And I'm also a PhD researcher with the Central St. Martins. I was delighted when Jonathan introduced me to the experimental pedagogist group. And this session stems from an image I sent Jonathan of Ungreen and Alia in reference to a casual conversation we were having about the cycles of the earth over WhatsApp. It was that image and the invitation this project instigated that prompted a field trip my colleagues Rosemary Blaney, Oric Lynch, Sharon Maxwell and I undertook with first year students in animation, graphic and digital design, film and digital video and fashion with promotion last Monday on March 21st. This is where I have to confess that I got caught up in the romance of the concept of 24 hours on earth. And that's what has inspired my approach to this happening. I have previously studied and taught at UAL, but my engagement for the PhD has been remotely um, due to the pandemic. And I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to make our interactions through um, the community of UAL and this experimental pedagogies research um, group more explicit about the places we are joining the shared space from. The environmental aspect of the project has twofold meaning to me, and perhaps many more. To me, one is the educational environment. My PhD research is on the importance of the design studio, so it amuses me that I am advocating and celebrating a project that brings learning out of this space. And um, the other aspect then is for my students to consider the wider environmental considerations of what's happening around them and appreciation for what that represents historically, ecologically, environmentally. There are many leaves that could be there. Um, you'll see from these mappings the different names of places um, and there's a whole uh, history and legacy and 
um, importance of that in Irish culture. But you'll also see the innocuous line that is the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, another symbol and sight of many justices and injustices um, on both sides of that line. But I'm not going to concentrate on that either today. But even these ponderings have brought home to me just how much more and richer um, this project could have been. I was bringing together um, four different disciplines, four different tutors who in their turn set for a wonderful briefs for the students around the environments that we were going to visit and what they represented. Um, but it also reminds me of, we had a wonderful conversation with Claudette, Louise and Laura around that session and that idea of um, tacit knowledge and what the students will pick up by just being in these spaces. So what you're about to see is, I apologize, um, a mash together at very short notice. Um, we had a wonderful uh, day, um, as I mentioned, at two incredible venues. And um, the footage you're about to see is some of the uh, wonderful things that we got up to and also some reflections from me and my colleague, Sharon Maxwell. And integrated into that because um, they are such interesting sites. Uh, they've been very kind to allow me to show footage from those venues that will give you further insights into the spaces. So, and if anyone was here and wants to chat at the end, um, I've left time for that for uh, discussion. So thank you, everyone. On the summit of Green On Mountain in North Donegal is the fortress known as the Green On of Alyuk commanding breathtaking views over Loch Foyle, Loch Swilly, mm. and the surrounding countryside. The hey, Pods, hey, Pods are, are picking up what's on my phone, not on... ...is the royal seat of the Kenel Njogan, rulers of the ancient kingdom of Alyuk, which comprised much of northwest Ulster. The terrace dry stone built wall is up to four metres thick and five metres high, enclosing a circular area some 23 metres across. At the east is the entrance passage, the only way in or out of the great fort. Near the entrance and within the stone wall of the castle are narrow passages that were probably designed for hiding people and valuables if the fort came under attack. The fort did come under attack in 1101, when Wirtuk O'Brien led an army on a six-week expedition deep into Donegal. They headed for the Green Arm, the seat of Donald McLaughlin, who refused to acknowledge Murtuk as High King. Murtuk reputedly destroyed the fortress when his soldiers each took a stone away with them as they headed back to Munster. The walls of the fort fell into ruin, but were finally rebuilt in the 1870s by Dr. Walter Bernard of Derry. Once again, the Green On stands proud on the summit of the mountain and is visible from much of the surrounding countryside as a continuing symbol of the power of the ancient kings of Northwest Ulster. However, what is not so well known is that under the heather that blankets the mountaintop are the remains of an even larger fortification. In fact, as many as three concentric walls surround the stone castle of the Green On, and form part of a hill fort that dates back to prehistoric times, demonstrating that Green On Mountain has been a symbol of political power in North Donegal for thousands of years. The Green On of Alyuk is a national monument in state care since 1904 and is managed by the Office of Public Works. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
was one of the um, lecturers that came on the trip on Monday. Yeah. So this is Wednesday. It's been a great week so far. <laughs> and um, I guess it's really great for me to have somebody to chat to about um, yeah. you know, why do we do this? Why do we um, extend outside of the studio? Yeah. And just to get your views on um, why you think trips, well, if you think trips like we did, the field trip away out into the environment, um, outside of the studio are beneficial to students. Yeah. And if so, what you think they're important. I know, and I, I guess we can get so caught up in busy deadlines and busyness that you forget about what's on your doorstep and what's outside of it. But I think, I suppose, because we're away with, like we were out with these great guys here, first year group, and I think when you're in secondary school and you're really working towards exams deadlines confines and everything's very restrict restrictive mm -hmm. and i think to some extent it tightens your you know you're afraid to risk take you're afraid to step out you're afraid to have fun you're mm. afraid to step outside of what people tell you to do because you'll not get the mark so when you come in as a first year i suppose what we try to do is to say forget all that mm. and just have fun again yeah not be so um, prescriptive and yeah, so when we're out and when we're like running around and greening or <laughs> when we're marveling at the bears, we become kids again. Like right. I became a kid, and sure. you became a kid. Yes, we all became yeah. kids. Yeah. So once you become a kid again, then you are having fun with it and you're not afraid of you're not afraid of making mistakes. You're not afraid of, you know, how that works. So when you start off a project with that mindset of it was great fun, we were running around, it was great, and I got to experience something, and then you bring it back to the studio, mm. and then you make something from it. You're starting from the best place because yeah, it was true. fun, and you know those shackles that have been placed upon you of having to conform or having to, you know, do things a certain way, it kind of like loosened that a little bit and it makes it more fun. So I guess to say from the top here, you can see three different counties. Um, it's said that you can see five, but I'm not sure how that would work geographically. Um, but it is this wonderful vantage point of the surrounds. And it was very windy, so I got it, thought I'd give you a repeat for a moment. Just what you were saying about Ingrain on every time I visit it, I feel a connection to mm. you know this project's called On Earth, you know. And I, even though it's man made, it feels so primal. I think, you know, yeah. and then of course, then you think you think of Earth, the, the clay as being the planet, but those rocks you imagine came from, yeah, and were carved or tipped from the earth as yeah. well. So um and I or guess, dug up and carried and yeah you know, yeah and that whole I think also I've, even in preparation for the trip I've been at sunset and then we were you know mm. morning and stuff and it feels like uh, even though that wasn't you know we've other structures in Ireland that would act like a clock or like a seasonal um, diagram but there's something it feels like the passage of time comes through yeah. in in that um structure as well yeah um when you're thinking about that I was thinking about the walkway that comes in because it's really really deep yes. it's like you're going into a tunnel yes, to come yeah. out so yeah it kind of feels like you're actually passing into modern day passing yes, into yeah. <laughs> stepping back in time like, it's like a time zone it's going through That's the tunnel true, actually, yeah. and how, how, who has done that walk mm, before us yeah <laughs>
scribe here, guys. Do the scribe here. What's the best thing about it? Oh, giving video by the way. <laughs> Where's the camera? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Drawing, sending jokes to Twitch. It's brutal. So, you guys are doing something for Char. I can see you doing something for the host. Yeah. <laughs> Describe the place in three words. Fine. 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 Uh, tall. Rocky. <laughs> Good words. Uh, I like those. I like those. Like 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 Do you like those three words? No, I like it in three words. So you guys said I like it. <laughs> We've got double words here. Sorry. What about your three words? Uh, spaces. Yes. Uh, yes. Possibly. <laughs> so inclined. Cool. Any other three words for here? Kira, hi. You're on camera. What would be three words to describe here? Circle. Circle. Good. They're doing the circle. Stone. You're, oh, you've tried heights? You did well to get here. Uh, 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 you got three words for what this place is? Uh, yeah, fortified. Fortified. Okay, three syllables. Right, cool. Uh, old. old, yes. Rocks. Okay, <laughs> so we've got a lot of circular rocks and old. Like moss. <laughs> moss. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> Watch out for the moss. It's not like Coliseum. Coliseum, actually, yeah. I mean, um, I think also, uh, like for this group here, brilliant group. Um, it's great just to. It's great just to know each other outside mm -hmm. of the classroom and just see another side of somebody's personality or just mm -hmm. you know another bit of fun and seeing somebody from a slightly different perspective and in terms of building a group and you know you're like they're all going to be with each other for the next four years yeah. and getting used to each other so <laughs> it's great to just to have um events that I suppose that, yeah, you know, that's fun, fun and, 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 and getting to know one another. Yeah. So we were discussing about, you know, COVID has meant there were none of these excursions even when they were in secondary school. Yeah. So it was really nice to be able to celebrate that. And, uh, and I think the two locations, two locations were brilliant. Um, so working uh, at Ungreenan and just, I mean, you can't help but be kind of struck by the historical value of it. and. I mean, the wind was blowing, the sun was shining, but it had such an, uh, like, it makes such an impression on you because it's so big and you're looking out onto such a beautiful landscape. Mm. And the landscape that we've looked out onto has uh, definitely inspired so many of the creations that uh, students are working on. Um, but yeah, it kind of links you back to where you're from. It links you back to why you're there. It links you back to who you are. And um, I think that is a really strong starting point as well, isn't it, mm -hmm. for any art piece? Yeah.
here gave the context of um, why Killian from Wild Wild West had a dog. And the next little video was filmed the day we were at um, Wild Island. So I've placed it in as well to give you a sense of what the students saw. Slightly out of sync, this is the context. The heart of the kids there can all plan the debunked. As Harry and Dan books are in a gush in me or have heaven. This is Gaelic, like, means about I've cut a stable in the end of the show. Credit Killian McLaughlin of Wild Ireland, Noon Now, the Fadlin and Hugger Meach the Yashu, Mahogamy the Rash, Quid Darnanbaha, Dukhsha. Is a shin, Mos Fadlin, our Narca General to fame, Madlash and Dulra, and Hopru Fresh. Ancient Irish people had a great respect for wildlife, they had a great respect for their predators. Their wolves were called Machir, which means son of the land or son of the country, and that was a term of almost royalty and unfortunately we've lost that attitude and i saw that when i when i proposed bringing these animals back if you can imagine i was met with a lot of objection and a lot of uh I suppose panic or hysteria that these animals are going to be roaming the countryside eating farmer sheep that has to go we have to you know look at what the wolf really is you know they're a, an essential part of the ecosystem without them everything in the in the pyramid below them goes out of balance and implodes yeah, and we see that imbalance with the, you know, there's maybe too many deer yeah. roaming in the national parks. Sure. There's possibly too many foxes, too many crows. Sure. Yeah, so these animals would help regulate that and bring back natural balance. Yeah, so the wolf is what's known as a keystone species. So you have to imagine it like a pyramid and all these blocks are in place. And the last pyramid at the top, or the last block in that pyramid at the top is a wolf. Uh, and, and everything else will be where it's supposed to be if the wolf is in place. Where there is a niche in nature, something else will step into its place to, to take over. And um, when the wolf disappeared, the foxes had a chance to overpopulate. And when they overpopulate and you have too many of them, it causes an imbalance in this ecosystem and other animals start to suffer. So if we had wolves, for example, in Ireland, the fox population would be kept at a perfect check, uh, at a perfect number. Uh, and animals like curlews and things that are ground nesting birds actually benefit from these big predators it works its way down the chain when you take the top one off the rest fall out of balance below them they saw that in, in yellowstone national park they had a massive problem there where the whole ecosystem fell out of balance when the wolf was hunted to extinction in 1995 they brought back 15 wolves almost overnight things changed in the park deer and the bison realized that the top predator was back in the park and they started to act differently so they no longer stayed in the one place and overgrazed it killing everything because they knew the wolves were back in the park they had to keep moving just in case the wolves were on their tails and animals like beavers and birds that hadn't been seen in the park in decades returned to the park the whole place is now back in balance like what's required to make this all at all possible you mentioned habitats there yeah we could maybe think about linking our national parks using wilderness corridors. And I mean literally linking Glenvey National Park in Donegal with Killarney National Park in County Kerry, that the bulls could quite literally roam from Donegal right down the west coast. It sounds a bit mad, but I think the ecological benefits would be tremendous. We may displace some of the farmers. I appreciate that, I understand that. But there are ways that farming and bulls can coexist. So, it doesn't have to be people losing their livelihoods. How about like something a bit less daunting or, or fearful for people? Ireland is a part of the European ecosystem and the wolf or the bear and the lynx are the top predators. So lynx may be an option. They're a large cat. They do prey on deer. And again, it's about having that predator back, even though the predator is not necessarily hunting or decimating the deer population. It's just them being there and the deer and the herbivores know that there's now a top predator back in the landscape so we must change our behavior to avoid them and that involves the deer keeping moving and, and stopping the overgrazing and, and giving the trees a chance to bloom but as i say that is an ecosystem and it must be looked at as a whole not just as little parts of a puzzle they all have to be put back before it functions properly We have wiped out a lot of nature, especially on an island where 
these animals can't come back. If you look in mainland Europe, down at Belgium, for example, and certain parts of Germany, the wolves have managed to make their own way back there. On an island like Ireland, we cannot wait for nature to come back. We have to do something to bring it back. But when we do, it, nature has evolved for millions and millions of years, and it has its own ability to manage itself. But it's up to us to reinstate it and then leave it alone. And let it look after Welcome back to Wild Ireland. I thought I would take you on a little walk through the woods and give you a bit of an update on what has been happening here at Wild Ireland. Our so bears this is are the same doing day we've fantastic. Been here. They've had a slow, lethargic winter, but they're picking it up now. They're getting ready for summer. They know it's coming. Yeah, they're in fantastic condition. They've just been in for a swim. I just missed them on the camera. They've been in swimming on a nice warm March day. So as you can see behind me, the wolves are doing really well. They're now approaching their third birthday and they are fully grown, huge, magnificent animals, and they're thriving here in their forest home. The <laughs> Irish goats had a little surprise for us the other morning. And this is a particularly significant birth, given how rare the old Irish goat is. This is our second old Irish goat kid, and we are delighted to be supporting the conservation of this rare breed. And here comes the proud dad. So this is a new arrival here at Wild Ireland. And this is Nara. Nara is a Japanese sika deer. She's tiny. I'm on my hunkers. And Japanese sika deer do not belong here in Ireland. Unfortunately, as pretty as she is, um, you can see she's starting to lose her winter coat at the moment. The winter coat, she's been scratching off that scratchy winter coat getting ready to bolt out now for the summer and as you can see she likes a good scratch and all that itchy winter coat pulled out but um this little one was an orphan she's fully grown she's about three years old but she was a little orphan and uh sika deer were brought to this country for hunting and they escaped from the estates and they thrived in ireland so particularly in southern ireland around wicklow you'll see lots of sika deer um the sad thing is that they actually hybridize with red deer and they're interfering with our native red deer genetics. And this is a very unhappy looking fee. What's wrong with you? So this is this is a pretty cool angle. Um, this is Fia, the red deer. Everybody will be familiar with my old friend Fia. This is Nara. And the two species are quite alike. You can see that Fia is a lot redder and Nara is more brown. Nara is much smaller than Fia. These two actually get on really well. They're, they're both females and they were both orphaned. So, oh, you like a good scratch. Um, so this is Fia, and of course Fia is a female red deer, and Nara is a female Sika deer, so there's no danger of them hybridizing. But they do actually get on with each other very, very well, despite the size difference. And it's pretty cool to come here to Wild Ireland and compare the two species of deer with each other. Nara is much smaller and much browner, and she's got a, she's got a little white tail, whereas Fia, is a red brown color and she's got a yellowy brown tail and that's one of the best ways to tell the difference in a sika and a red in ireland it's not just red and sika deer we also have these guys and this is a fallow deer now most fallow deer are not as dark colored as this little lady this is gem and she's another little orphan that came to us so she's a fallow deer and this is the third species of deer that we have here in ireland um you can see her the winter coat again has fallen out and she's starting to get some spots in the back. So these are little spotty guys. You can see these. One of the best places to see fallow deer is actually in the Phoenix Park in Dublin. You'll remember our wild borlets that were born here at the very start of lockdown. So here they are now. Absolute monsters. It's exactly two years ago to the date that Wild Ireland closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I guess I have to thank you guys uh, that supported the online shop and donated to us. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody that supported us during this difficult time. So despite all of the challenges that the last two years have presented, we have been able to keep on going with our rescue missions. And a lot of you will be familiar with the rescue mission that we're currently undertaking in Russia. We have been trying to rescue two brown bears from Russia 
Boo and Teopa are their names. They're two adult male brown bears that are kept in totally unsuitable conditions, small cages where they barely have any space to turn around or do anything natural like bears should do. With the ongoing war in Ukraine and the sanctions imposed in Russia, it's proving even more difficult to rescue these two bears. You can be sure of one thing. Here at Wild Ireland, we are not giving up on Boo and Teopa. Your support has been greatly appreciated and we've put the money donated towards our new state-of-the-art bear forest. And I'll show you that now. This is Boo and Teopa's new home. As you can see, it's an absolutely massive forest home for Boo and Teopa. To come all the way from those tiny little cages to this natural forest, there's natural spring-fed pools, there's trees to climb in, and most importantly, there's space for these animals to roam and act out. So these are two that they've rescued already. <laughs> <laughs> they've rescued from the cages, from uh, the circus there where they were again. I think they're siblings though, aren't they? It was six years. Yeah. <laughs> and then going to wild ireland and uh, i mean that's definitely where the kid comes in like just like watching bears and and observing them observing how they interact with each other and kind of i suppose <laughs> it's like deep philosophical but it's almost like your place in the world you kind of see yeah. where where everything that ecology yeah. yeah um and just how they interact and how they play with each other and taking yes. that on board uh, as well. Yeah, because yeah, I think obviously with the fashion students that um, you're working with and that are diligently working here behind us, um, it was looking at colour study, looking at the environment as a source of inspiration, um, which I think, you know, we've just had a quick look around and that it's, I love how every student took their own perspective mm -hmm. on that and took their own take on it. And I really agree with you that idea of becoming more open and unlimited by mm. perspectives. You're not looking to a book. It's a very um, primary experience. You know, if we're yeah. talking about primary sector research, this is going on a visit. It's exactly. really tapping into it. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. That's the most obvious reason that anyone really thought of saying no. that. But, uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Like primary experience of your theme is, is definitely going to give you the most profound mm. sort of journey with your development of that and how you, develop uh your design through to the final piece because you've lived it you've been there you understand it and the colors you see yourself are so much more vibrant than what the camera captures yes i i completely when i was reflecting on the images i've taken yeah it's like no it's not quite right it wasn't it doesn't quite capture what we experience yeah but it's interesting because you know so that was it became relevant to so many different disciplines you know the animation students were looking at the motion of they were looking at i'm going on for a setting um the animals for uh, you, you could almost see them <laughs> picking out the walk cycles and how they, they would bring that into their work and obviously film and, and photography students were capturing the great um, scope of materials mm. um i don't know what my point was with this <laughs> but that idea that different, you know, yeah. different disciplines can find different things within that yeah um, which is really important and you know that's again i guess why wild ireland was selected as one of the um, venues, the proximity between the two is perfect, but its ethos is really interesting as well. And I think something that's good for the students to consider you know, the fact that it was, um, you know, when, when animals are in captivity, there is sort of ethical questions around that, but the way, the reason for those animals being there, the, um, the hardships and the horrible conditions that they have been saved from to be there and the ethos of rewilding and bringing animals that would have been native to Ireland back to yeah. Ireland, I think sort of definitely overshadows that. And for mm. us in the wilds of Donegal to have be able to access um, those experiences on our doorstep pretty much, I think is, is something we often take for granted that you think you have to go very far away to get mm -hmm. um, the, the, the latest shiny thing or yeah. you know whereas i hope um that trips like this also highlights students what a rich um 
heritage, inspiration, legacy we have on our doorsteps yeah. here as well. Just seeing the value of what we have and yeah, being able to explore that creatively, whether it's with fabrics or with animation or with photography. Um, yeah, what better starting point really? It, it definitely works for that. And um, yeah, just thinking about drawing a line a party with, you know, you're saying with the animals. Not that, you know, the, the fact that we're uh, institutionalized, we're always, yes, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're working with them. Well, actually, that it is, though, as you say, yeah. that's sort of breaking away from, because it is an undertaking to, with timetables, to be able to take yeah. students from different disciplines away and that, yeah. and for, like, we have a common entry program where some of these students would have had first semester together, but they don't get a chance then to meet each other after that yeah. because time tells and stuff. So, yeah, that's idea. Uh, and like, I think every room that you're in uh, affects how you react in it. It affects how um, how you become creative or how you how you kind of like work through what you're working on. So it's interesting just to take something completely out. So we're talking about the captivity <laughs> of. Of, I don't either, want to say of because I don't want to draw a line with like, we're animals or anything, but I'm just trying to think about captivity fact. So we're taking out we're a natural environment, that's it. Uh, or we're putting into a natural yes, environment. Yes, yeah. Maybe that's what, nicer, it, that's what it means. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Getting more yeah. natural. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it was really good. It was a really good day. And it was we were just, so lucky with the weather. Yeah. <laughs> oh, people in, in all over the world will be saying, I thought Ireland was rainy <laughs> and we'll be showing lovely. <laughs> Uh, sunshine footage but uh, we were very lucky yeah Ooh. yeah well i think i shall leave it there. Okay. thank yes. you very much well, thank that. you sir cool we were fortunate to have a richness of um, video and still footage that we captured at wild ireland and i showed some sketches earlier but as it's so soon after the session students are still working on and um, the source material the primary research we did but I had to include the wonderful experience we had, the incredible, I shouldn't say wonderful, because the are slightly fearful that they were disturbed, that they um, began to help, but it was all of us that experienced um, the primacy of seeing these majestic animals howling was just incredible. So I've left this in a minute. It's shaky and hardy. So, um, and I'm going to leave it at that and start hopefully have some discussions with you after this clip. Thank you.
Let me put back on my video. Uh, that was to give you some uh, an overview of um, the session, as I say, uh, it happened Monday week ago. And um, it's been, it was a bit slapdash to put uh, footage together, but I hope people get a sense of what the students experienced. And um, yeah. I open up to questions, I guess. There's lots of things I could say about it, but are there any thoughts? Um, the first structure was absolutely amazing. And I just, I like, I put a question in the um, yes. chat. And I'm just, uh, just interested to know whether the, uh, the fortress was uh, how far it expanded out because um, obviously you can you could see in the footage you could see like one possible circle but you couldn't even from the aerial you couldn't see a third circle yes yeah I, you can see two I wonder can I get that footage up just um, and did, did they explain to you how far it went out and sort of like how many people would have lived there and no no um because we actually didn't get a guided tour it was all from um footage that we or like from research that we had done that we then um communicated to the students but yeah so there you can see there's i think this is just where people have traversed you know this is just possibly the walkway but it's I think it's these white lines here and um, that they're talking about and to my mind and then there is this other sort of yeah. area here ditch around the, there okay because that would kind of make a little bit more sense with if there were people living within it then they yeah. would need to have a certain amount of land within it to be able to feed themselves yes. you know, did yeah. they, if, if they came to a position that they were needing to go into siege yes if they're under threat or that yes yeah. yeah um and to my mind i spoke about it in the yes certainly i think that was that people would find refuge and exist within the walls the other thing is um there's another well there's lots of sort of um structures like this or, or mounds on top of uh, high ground in Ireland but the most famous one was excavated and that's in Newgrange um in County Meath and um I talked about you know that idea of structures like this being acting as seasonal clocks um and Newgrange certainly is that um they it was it's incredible when you visit because they can mimic um, on the shortest day the light. It's a tunnel. So if you imagine that this this structure is covered, so it's dark. It's like Stonehenge. Light. Stonehenge, yes, but the structure is still here. So let me I'll stop sharing that and I'll try and see if I can get an image of Newgrange. Um, but the light, the, it's a huge passageway um, and the light only on the 21st of December can pass straight through that axis and it lights up the chamber inside. So it's just incredible. And it's older than the pyramids. It's everything put in, in terms of the pyramids for age. But, um, and to my mind, when you see um, the, the outline of what is um, under on Green and Alia, um it really uh, makes you think that there's something very interesting under this and and potentially 
um, has a similar sort of function or would have had a similar function. So um, this is what it looks like. And this is the passage way that the light goes through. Um, and this gives you a sense of, um, it's just the, the engineering, oh, sorry, I thought that was an image. Oops, let me. This is sorry. a switch bike. Um, it lights up this passage, but the, the, it's an incredible feat of engineering because um, it's a corbel roof and it has meant that it has remained dry inside and the remains that it was, it's thought that it had, it's a burial chamber um, that, and uh, some of the, the basins that would have held uh, the remains um, were intact when this was excavated. There is some, as I feel is the case with Ungrenalia as well, um, these, they would have been in disrepair and somebody else's vision is what has created them again, but um, the hope is that they were based on um, accurate descriptions and what have you. So there is that whole translation as well of, of heritage that um, becomes interesting, but you see the, the ceiling here, just how it's laid out and, um, yeah, this is a good example of, so the light comes through the shaft and then illuminates the, the inner. So can you stand on the roof? You can stand on the roof. Well, it's a, it's a protected structure now, so. Yeah, 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 I know. You but could, well, like could in have. theory you could have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and then the, it's I, also really sorry. interesting, um, you know, because the, well, on Green and Alia, I didn't explain in the video means, um, on, on green is the sun in Ireland, so and um, Alia is earth or stone, so um, it's like the earth, the sun, or the, the, the mind of the sun basically is the description. Um, but in uh, Newgrange, you have um, the sort of pagan uh, symbolism or whatever gods they had in those days, and, and the, this sort of symbol would be assigned or historians have said you know represents the sun and um, the different uh, symbolism on these really intricate um, stones that are at the front of the entrance so yeah so you can see if I um, stop sharing this and go back to the image we had I think you can see that there are similarities in structure so I think the older structure that was on this site potentially had given that you know we have this wonderful 360 view of the countryside from there that it, it possibly held a similar um, function um, for the people of that time yeah i, I i'm fascinated by <laughs> this this structure so, so it actually could have been a burial chamber rather than a fort the early iteration of it, whatever was on the site before the eighth century, was, was well, a burial. Well, it hasn't been excavated, but when you look at similar structures, that's that would be a conclusion you could probably educationally. Er, and they, and they, they can't do, they can't do it sonically. They probably will, but actually, there's many of these types of structures. Not not the stone cairn on the top, but if a lot of places in Ireland have mines like this and they just haven't all, you know, I, I hope they're on a list that will be um, mm. but in Newgrange there are two similar um, structures it's it's a very rich area for um, this and there's another area called the Hill of Tara which has great um, significance in Irish history and so that's an area that they're looking at present and I presume they'll extend from that then and the line but um and the, the great thing about Ireland is that we have this wonderful history of mixing mythology and um religion and all of these things all get merged into the same story um so a lot of cairns not obviously on a mountain top as this is and so and I, I'd say people looking in going that's not a mountain but uh, that's uh, um 
they would be called fairy forts as well and there's this sort of mythology around touching them and and sort of uh, interfering with them so there's the, there's a legacy of that that we're sort of moving away from as well and, and getting this the curiousness of what really until it lies within them as well so but it, it's just an incredible place and i think it is that you know the engineering of the structure is one thing but there's something about the earth of it that you feel is connected to so many things you know to the land and to the generations before and it's just the the purity of everything around it is, is just really interesting yeah i feel like i, I feel this the prompt to do the trip was fantastic and that's i have, I have to thank um the um ep or d for that but i feel like this is the start of a project that will be really interesting because even when i was articulating why i was bringing the students th to these places for this video i was like oh i probably didn't say that to them or they probably weren't as clear about that and part of that is that you hope by being in an environment that they absorb that. But sometimes you feel like maybe they're, they're not tapping into that. And of course, as you see from the video as well, they're a different generation they're, and they're young and they're wanting to, you know, it was, it was about being out of the confines of the classroom as they would see it. There's, you know, there's still, I think, um, particularly for first years that the last two years, even in their schooling was, a, you know very different environment for them as well so I think um there was there's a lot going on for that group and they're they're dealing with a lot so um I think yeah it, it, it I loved doing this because it made me consider so many things and there's so many strands I could pull in you know even I talked briefly about the names there's a wonderful playwright Brian Friel that um uh but he ended up living in Donegal and he one of his famous uh, plays is translations and it's looking at um you know the mapping of Ireland and what turned out to be in many cases the anglicization of names and that sort of hybridization as well and I think there's some there's a whole project in that as I was looking at maps and uh yeah it's just but my big thing is for the students to realize that and I guess for me to realize as well having taught in London and you know the students been all of the wonderful exhibitions and um, institutions that are at their doorstep that this this is the advantage that these students have and to for them to see the wealth and to recognize how important and, and rich that is also oh mark you you've that's perfect i was about to do that so um stacy's session with james is coming up next um and I'm, if there's any five more minutes if there's any questions or i guess people should go and get a cup of tea or refreshments before um, Stacey's session, but. Um... That was brilliant. I, I mean, it, as with all these sessions, they open up more. And as you said, it's opened up more to more possibilities of doing more of this. Uh, yes. it, it was terrific. Well, I, I, and also just to see what the students, it was this day after almost that the fashion students were working on the, this, the images you saw on it. I'm really excited to see where that goes. Their next session is today. So it's all those sort of things of timetabling as well. Of I wanted that we were, I had hoped that we would do this session live and that that would really be the 24 hours. And then that didn't seem feasible, but I wanted to try and end, like we were there at this time last week, or no, sorry, on the Monday last week. And I wanted it to sort of similar light and things like that. but. Yeah, I, I think I maybe have tried to do too much, <laughs> but it was brilliant. I, I'm really grateful for the prompt to do it. And I know the students have benefited for it greatly from it as well. So well, remember next year is next year. Yes. And we, we'll be doing 48 hours next year or whatever. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? I mean we, we yeah. had, it, was a, it was a very quick. Yeah. January, let's do it, bump, and that's what's so exciting about it. And we'll have to keep that vibe going. But yeah, we can you can plan it out or not plan it out or whatever, yeah. however for next year. But I just want to say thank you. That was absolutely fabulous and deeply enjoyable, and and has woken us all up. I suspect. 
Oh, good. I know. I, I feel like maybe next year I'll just invite you all to come and we'll all do a drop <laughs> or something. Because that's probably what would be most interesting for people. But yeah. Um, thank you all so much. I really appreciate you taking the yeah. time. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Carla. Thanks, Beautiful. Bye bye. Bye bye.